acres, and a vibrant place with distinctive and memorable ways to experience it, especially around dining, recreation, socializing, shopping, and living life. So that is the adopted vision statement, which forms the basis or the foundation for uh, what we're working on. So I'm going to launch right in. The directive uh, number one, and they're not numbered, but the first one that we're going to look at has to do with the Lake Street Corridor. And the finding is that because traffic noise, volume, and speed on Lake Street are not mitigated with pedestrian comfort amenities, pedestrians avoid the corridor, and over time, so have the types of retailers that seek pedestrian districts in which to locate. So that is my opinion, my finding, uh, and I welcome your critique of that, whether that's accurate or not. And the directive is to mitigate the negative traffic impacts of Lake Street with a suite of street design modifications and pedestrian comfort streetscape amenities. And the strategies that fold out of that are all kind of embedded within the diagram that each of you have a copy of at your desk, and I'll kind of walk through them. First one um, is to work with MnDOT in Washington County. And obviously, this is a MnDOT roadway today. There might be a time in the future when it is turned back to Washington County to become a county road rather than a state highway. Um, so both of those entities, both of those agencies, make sense to collaborate with around the future design of um, Public Street. So the first one is the narrow lanes and widen the streetscape. Um, that suggests, obviously, that uh, Lake Street could be redesigned and that within MnDOT standards uh, and future Washington County standards, potentially, the opportunity may exist to narrow the lanes and to widen the streetscape in exchange for narrower traffic lanes. The second one is to implement pedestrian-oriented streetscape with street trees, decorative lighting, um, seating, all of the amenities that you would envision within a vibrant commercial downtown district. Uh, the next one is to redesign pedestrian crossings, <coughs> including at the traffic circle, so at Broadway. The idea of, of re strategizing how those crossings work and maybe even where they are. Um, Mid block crossing is in kind of a unique spot close to second uh, northwest, so that's kind of an interesting one. And then maintain and expand on street parking. So I, I just want to touch on that one because uh, I think there's a tendency to communities in exchange for wanting more streetscape, which is the right tendency. It's great to have more sidewalk space, more streetscape space. Um, I would encourage you to hang on to on street parking along with that because having a parked car and having the opportunity for drivers to be able to stop in front of the storefront and run in, grab something, and run back out is really important to the vibrancy of downtown. So, um, yes, we want more streetscape, but doing an exchange of eliminating parking, I would suggest, is not a good strategy. Um, so, so those are the kind of the key strategies that are the basis of this particular one. Any thoughts, questions? Yes, um, some buildings already kind of establish a, a streetscape or a sidewalk width of about 12 feet. That's where at least maybe 40% of the frontage exists on, on 61, at least north of the roundabout. Um, so you got that kind of dimension to live with. I applaud the idea of maintaining parking, even though it's, it's in some ways minimalized, and we're trying to replace it with ramps and other things, but uh, I applaud that effort because I think that's important for storefront issues. Um, but that's the realm you have to work in, about 12 feet. New construction will give you more, but present day construction holds you back about that far. <coughs> so that's a limit that's kind of hard to see how much more can really happen there. When we went into the patio stuff in like Minneapolis and elsewhere, they pushed out on the sidewalks, but there's a point, you know, you've talked about six foot sidewalks that at least allow you to bypass. So you got maybe only six foot to do something with in some of those territories. Yeah. And I would, um, in looking at preliminarily, again, at the, the lane dimensions, I think there's maybe four feet or five feet of space um, that potentially could be shrunk out of the street and given over the sidewalk so that 12 could turn to 14. 
and maintaining parking as well. And maintaining parking. And actually, some of that space is within the parking bay because the parking bays are very wide. Um, and that's the MINDA standard. They're, all the dimensions are of the era that MINDA designed the, the roadway. But everything has shrunk a little bit from a standards perspective. And if it goes from MINDA to, or excuse me, to Washington County, the opportunity exists to even shrink those a little bit more. And I think also, right now, through most spots, it's a three lane. So there's a lane in each direction and a center sport lane or a center um, turn lane. There are fewer and fewer in most spots um, opportunities even to turn off into parking lots or into um, uh, other entries on the roadway. So there could be the possibility of exploring whether that third lane even makes sense. And could the lanes be, could the entire street from curb to curb be uh, dimensionally narrow, giving more space for the lanes? It may not make sense once everyone dives into it and realizes all of the logistical needs out of the roadway, but it's worth exploring. I imagine there's a few spots certainly could be strategized anyway, depending on the building function, where you could eliminate some 61 parking and bump out and have a you know more relaxed decorative landscape area as well. Really strategic areas, I think that could make sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there any other points of feedback on this first one? So the next one is really around district parking. Um, three of the four, and we're looking at, I'm kind of thinking of this as quadrants of downtown, um, and I'll just point them out. From Broadway up to second, northwest, my view is kind of the, the northern half, so the, the northwest quadrant is from the from Centennial or from the trail over to Lake Street. The northeast is from Lake over to Memorial Park, or the, the lake itself. Southwest, obviously, is <coughs> south of Broadway, uh, southeast and south of Broadway for the lake. So even though our, our true downtown district <coughs> that we're studying as part of this process goes beyond each of those um, crossing streets, they're the ones that really kind of make up this core downtown. So that's what I'm, I'm looking at from a parking standpoint, um, as well as some of the other strategies. So the finding is that three of the four downtown quadrants are at least slightly shy of adequate parking volume. Because pedestrians avoid crossing Lake Street, and because Lakeside Memorial Park, combined with surrounding retail and food destinations, pose the largest peak demand, parking in that quadrant is at a premium and a limiting factor in downtown carrying capacity. But additional parking in that quadrant is not feasible. So the notion is that um, most of the parking demand, at least today, in the development pattern is in this northeast water. Um, between Broadway and Second and Lake to Memorial Park, Lake Side Memorial. But putting any kind of structured parking or more parking in that quadrant would really negatively impact or affect the character and um, the circulation of that space. So um, the suggestion is that. Uh, Forest Lake could look at creating a district parking facility in the downtown core with a, a direct pedestrian linkage to Lake Street and Lakeside Memorial Park, but not put it in that water. The strategies are, as part of a broader redevelopment, construct structured parking district, uh, structured district parking in the northwest quadrant of the downtown core with line, a liner of retail and commercial space. So. There seems to be some opportunity in the middle portion of the block between Second and Broadway to construct or to take advantage of a, a fairly open space or some parcels that seem prime for redevelopment. Um, construct structured district parking as part of a redevelopment strategy that puts a commercial or residential uh, use on the street frontage and multi-story district parking on the back end Centennial. And then connect that with potentially um, a skyway that leads across lake and drops down um, 
uh, maybe at the back edge of the buildings or the properties with a direct connection and the Memorial Park. And um, use that as a way to bring people to the center of the district, essentially. Take advantage of the possibility of redevelopment that could be um, used as leverage in constructing that parking. And make sure that it's got great connections both where it sits, but also especially over that Cody's water. Um, I'll just read through these and then uh, we can discuss in more detail. Uh, we talked about Skyway. Um, conduct a parking study, but the preliminary findings that we've made are that downtown is generally short by two to three hundred stalls. And you can see uh, on your sheet the fairly cursory, but analysis that we've done of the parking. The first one is what is required of downtown today. So it's basically five per thousand, five stalls per thousand square feet of either retail or office. Um, that is kind of an old standard that people generally are not using in downtown districts anymore. The more uh, preferred standard or kind of modern or contemporary standard is four stalls per thousand. But you can see that if we use the five, um, we're short by about 450 stalls within those four quadrants of downtown. If we move back or step back a little bit to four stalls per thousand, we're short by about 220. And then if this happened to be, I put it in just maybe for curiosity, but if this were a transit environment where there's a lot of bus activity or even light rail, something like that, um, you might be looking at two to two and a half stalls per thousand square feet. Um, and in that case, you've got more than enough parking. Um, but that's not the case for downtown Florida, so you're probably not uh, in your future, or at least in your term future. Um, so if we go the middle of the road, that kind of four stalls per thousand, the two to three hundred stall addition, um, is going to accommodate at least preliminarily what we view as the, the demand or the, the under service of the current downtown. Question, the parking ramp with the new storefront. Yeah. I mean, besides parking ramp, is that how many stalls would something like that accommodate if it was three or four stories? I think I read somewhere, or two to three. Two to three hundred stalls okay. is what um, would be needed. And uh, it's, a, you know, it's a little bit challenging to, to know how deep the retail would be or whether it would be single or dual-sided residential on top. Um, but if, if the liner use of development on Lake Street is kept relatively narrow, so in other words, not going deep into the lot, um, we think a block generally in the space could accommodate something like that plus um, what is already parked on that, curb, on that spot. So it'd be more like, and that's where you get into 300 or so, because there's about 70 stalls that sit there today. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. There are a couple of things about parking. I'm curious. Why didn't you um, take advantage of the uh, on-site parking that's north of the parking ramp that you've indicated there? Is there an ownership issue, a fight, or something? Because that seems to be an obvious place to reach up at least a, a single tier of parking, yeah. if not more. Um, and it seems like it would take a load off of the rest of it. Mm -hmm. The other question I have about parking is the distribution. We're down there at the north end. Uh, down here at the south end, uh, there are opportunities again. Uh, and I'm not seeing them explored. Maybe they're explored in the idea of a future development area. Because I think that it's a, kind of a hot potato territory right there. But that has the opportunity to be below grade, partially below grade, and uh, working its way on up. With uh, because what would happen above it if it's going to be either residential or commercial, and commercial doesn't go very well up, um, the residential will want some altitude to be able to visualize the lake and get advantage of the lake, and then the values will go way up. So there seems to be a reason to sit down under that idea and beef it up where the parking is not denying commercial on the front, just like you're not denying it down here, but taking advantage of distributing the parking, because where we have trouble with parking is on the, the south end. That's where everybody's parking and being pushed into the other northern end, and that gets further and further away from the business. And so yeah. if we could distribute it better, 
and do more with this southern end, and that seems to be the place for it, uh, I think you can accomplish a lot more. So the, the reason I went this route, and I'm not saying it's the right route, if, we, if this group, or if you think we should be looking at more of a distributed pattern, uh, I'll do it. I'll, I'll make that change on the diagram. But the notion or the reason is that um, this site, I think we anticipate is going to be a future redevelopment area, uh, at least along Lake Street. So not this building, not the existing ground, ground building, but the, the, um, the front edge on Lake Street. And um, it's a really tight site. And getting more parking than is needed to accommodate that specific development is going to be very challenging based on the preliminary views that I've seen. Yeah. Well, I think you're going to find that the, the distribution idea is really important, mm -hmm. especially to that territory. And I think the footprint, staying away from the residential side and the plaza building, uh, and just simply working with the footprint, I don't know that the um, future Muddy Tower of Vanelli's is part of an expansion story that seems obvious that it could be. Yeah. But behind that is enough width certainly to go down and take care of parking and to even take part of an upper level and take care of parking. Mm -hmm. There's enough territory there to really do a sizable, you know, middle double and two ends parking kind of traveling down through that because the width is there. Uh, and it just seems like that's a natural place to introduce parking to downtown uh, off that one road that's right next to Daniela's or was Daniela's. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm open to that. Certainly, we can we can illustrate this as kind of opportunities for district parking um, in both of those spots, um, or even I suppose you know somewhere on this side, although it seems more problematic. Well, you know, I think Mark, and you know, looking at that southwest side, I mean, both of those existing businesses have great parking lots for their own purposes. Where on southwest side? Kodiak. Yeah, so Kodiak and Millard Stevens, right? I mean, they've got great parking lots behind their buildings. So, I mean, I would agree that on the southeast side, you know, any redevelopment that's considered for that space, I mean, they certainly need to do a good job of incorporating parking. Well, for their own purposes, plus there could be this public aspect to it yep. because you really can tie that into a development yep. program. No, I agree. And so I'd hate to give that up. You go across the street and there's a landowner that's sitting there with his fairly rectangular square site uh, waiting to satisfy his own purposes, you know. Well, I think, I think Bruce has a good suggestion for the use of that, that rectangular plot as well. Is that a city piece of property then in the future? Purchase. I would suppose, I would suspect so. Because that's, that's always the catch. Okay. Which property? We're, We're over where you have the Hardwood Trail Wayside. Yeah. Uh, that's it's an open piece of property right now. I forget the ownership. Yeah, and that is you know, I'll get to that that suggestion. Before we get there, before we get there, though, I do want to make sure I understand Bruce your your concerns for the the future redevelopment area, the current Vanilla yeah. property. Your your concern is that whatever's going to redevelop there, just keeping parking needs contained within that site you suspect is going to be challenging. So then to add the additional two to 300 spaces that are needed, I just want to make sure I understand your concern. Do you think that's overburdening that one site if we're? It probably would. However, there probably is some opportunity for district parking um, or kind of common parking yep. within that redevelopment site. So I think this, the idea of basically taking a graphic approach to suggesting some kind of district parking here some kind of district parking here, to me, makes sense. And, and I think I should, if the group is okay, I think I should add that. Well, I think it's important that distribution just has been, today's world, in today's situation there, the, the, the outcry is we can't have much of a business on that end because it gets, all well, the parking gets pushed remote. And yeah. so uh, if you can pull it down, now you're gonna have less parking going in and out if you distribute in two places. And I still think you should take advantage of that very northern part up there of the uh, behind the front stairwell building yeah. like that's called and I'm kind of expanding it <laughs> there. We actually that was the first spot that I looked and because of the fact that that building doesn't seem like a redevelopment candidate and they own that parking that uh, there might be more uh, fertile ground so to speak within this area that otherwise would redevelop well, I think there is. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Back. Yeah. I think there is, but 
Um, and the landowner on that building on the north end is a very friendly partner. I mean, could be a very friendly partner to the fact that there's going to be enhanced parking right behind them and enclosed to some degree sheltered parking. And uh, I, I just think it's a plus for them to think about that as well. I'm happy to I, I do think it's worth at least noting some level of district-wide parking on the, the Vanelli site as being desirable. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, all of this is subject to how plans actually materialize, but I, I do think, it, to Mark's point, that that is a public amenity that may be an important point of discussion in the future. Mm -hmm. But uh, also, I appreciate the challenges overall, and perhaps that's not, perhaps that you know, I, keeping the, the northern parking, I think, to some, you know, of some scale, I think, is still important. Oh, I agree with yeah, you 100%. Yeah. I'd like to see it spread out a little bit more, take advantage of it, still incorporate yeah. The, yeah. the streetscape commercial buildings fronting it, because that's the walkable city. Yep. If you have not a big opening to a parking lot, but you have buildings and businesses going right down the street. Great. How about the Skyway idea? Anyone think it's nuts? So we got into a really interesting conversation. We, we were considering um, pedestrian over and under passes at a roundabout right next to the high school. And there was a fair amount of just um, discussion around whether kids in particular, you know, we were talking about high school students and whether they would use it. Like, would they go up to then cross or would they just take a run across the roundabout? And um, if, if we're talking about multi-level parking and people are already, you know, in an elevator or stairwell, um, assuming we can accommodate the expense structure, it's, I like the idea of it. I'm just concerned about whether people would actually use it or I cross that all of the time. And if there was a skyway there, I personally wouldn't use it, but I'm also not parking. So, um, I'm interested in other people's comments or your experience on we're not a Skyway town and this type of a facility do you think it would get used of I think a Skyway makes sense there I mean people cause their uh, you know fear of their lives right now I mean I've tried and crossing that just a mail a letter across the street <laughs> and that's been one of our, our big concerns yeah. is the speed of the traffic and crossing and the crosswalk is way down here and even there, there, little leery. <coughs> I mean, that's been one of the big concerns. And like you said, Mara, if they're in an elevator anyway, right. I mean, mm -hmm. what's the difference between hitting two or one? That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. If it wasn't able to connect to parking that's already above grade, I don't think it would work very well. Mm -hmm. But the fact that someone is driving into a structure and has, the structure has a lobby, and the lobby is going to have an elevator, and there could be a skyway level as part of that elevator. Um, the other side actually is more challenging because the space is tight. There is a little bit of an opening right there. It's, not, it's a little bit of an alleyway through that zone. Um, but it's, I mean, it's not super easy either. Right. Does it have to be an enclosed skyway in order for it to be effective, or could it be an open bridge, or is that just another snow removal nightmare? Um, I, I think it would be great if it were open on the sides and covered. So okay. People are protected from snow and rain, but it's not a, a glassed in skyway. Like and I don't mean to put the budget hat on too early in the conversation, I just can't help myself. <laughs> so would there be an elevator on, on the east side? On the west side, certainly. On the west. I, I would suggest an elevator on the yeah, east side. Yeah, I would as well. say, I think that would have to be. It might be an opportunity to pull more. This is not an extensive Minneapolis Skyway by any means, but it might be an opportunity to pull more value up to the second level if it's mm -hmm. commercial. Mm -hmm. um, it's it also, it's a, it's a, we got a height issue. We got to get up to a certain height for whatever buddy's moving a, a truck with a house on it underneath it. What was the same well, battle we had at the other uh, bridge yeah, going it's across? Be 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14. Oh, it'll be an off schedule thing, 14, you know, in terms yeah. of where it's at. Mm -hmm. Then a parking ramp can have that higher medium level as well. So, I mean, I think the Skyway is pretty much the only way you're going to make west meet east comfortably uh, and do a good job of it. Um, otherwise, we're back to streetscape stuff. 
Well, but I mean, if you are narrowing the streets and you're incorporating some bump outs to for parking and so forth, I mean, you could do a bump out there and have a crosswalk that's, you know, controlled, depending on the budget. I think ultimately you want to get people out of the street. However, in this particular case, um, it's at least, in my view, it's at least worth exploring. Um, being able to get people to a, a larger concentrated district parking facility over to Memorial Park kind of smoothly and um, without having to do a lot of crossings. So in, in some ways, I feel like this district parking facility is mostly geared to things that are happening today in the quadrant, either within the parking lot or the, the park itself. Mm -hmm. um, that's where the demand, and I, I talked about kind of the, the carrying capacity of downtown, that it seems to be your limitation right now. Um, when things are going on in the park and people are trying to shop, the two just are not mixing mm -hmm. very well because they want to be in the same space. So. Is there any plan to move the trailer parking outside of downtown? I do not have that in here, um, but I, I'm happy to talk about it with the group and I do think we should. Let's, let's put that in kind of on our, to, on our discussion right. list. I'd like to discuss with you. We need to say put that in the parking lot. Put that in the parking lot. The circle that you just identified in the northwest. Yeah, right. Uh, okay, let's come back to that one. All right, Centennial Drive. Centennial Drive, did, do all of you know what Centennial Drive is? I wasn't sure how familiar you were with the name. Um, it's functional to those familiar with downtown, probably not a, a real inviting or understood access or circulation route for most people, especially visitors. It's complicated, it's um, hidden. People don't really understand where it goes, what it connects to. So the directive would be to redesign Centennial as a strategically important access route to parking, district parking potentially, um, and businesses. Strategies are to narrow the street to the extent feasible while maintaining two-way traffic. We had a discussion with Brian, uh, Dan, and I last week about, you know, from an engineering standpoint, what kinds of things we can be thinking of. This is going to be a challenging corridor. There's no question. There are more things we would want to do with this street corridor than space available. Um, so we you, we have to be borrowing land. I'll put that in quotes. Um, from the neighbors, either the county uh, on the trail side or potentially private businesses on the business side. Um, but to narrow that to the extent possible, much of it is wider than it would certainly need to be. Um, to implement streetscape enhancements, probably streetscape light. It doesn't have to be as extensive as a, a main street. Um, but streetscape enhancements, including lighting and sidewalk on the business side, so people can circulate that route apart from the trail, because I don't think folks, unless they want to use the trail, they can see the trail as a, a downtown sidewalk kind of an entity. Um, add on street parallel parking on the trail side where it's possible. It wouldn't have to be the entire length, but to have some trail side parking would be, I think, a really good idea. That's a great idea. And then add wayfinding signage at each corridor entry, and you'll see at the end we talk more about wayfinding. Um, so people have a sense of what it is, where it goes. Now we know that at Broadway, Centennial is a right in, right out, either going south or north. And um, that's probably all handy because that median at Broadway we don't believe is gonna go away. So uh, it's not a through route, but it is an access. The trail system is no longer a railroad right away that's been maintained for the future of light rail or anything else, is it? Or is there? Yeah. The county have control over it? Will it always be simply? I know when they did the pedestrian bridges there, there was the argument that someday it could be recaptured and that the right of way was still controlled by the railroad. Um, we had that discussion with Ryan too. Um, Ryan said in discussions he's had with uh, the county, they seem to have relaxed the, the rail authority. They've relaxed what they view as what's possible within the corridor, but they still view it as a future transit route. Um, so in their mind, the trail is a temporary use. 
I suppose it temporary is a long-term thing too sometimes, so <laughs> I don't doubt that you could impose some land parking on the right-of-way of that trail. Uh, because there are places where the grade's not so severe that you can't do that, and certainly the parallel parking or angle parking. Um, at any rate, I think there's an asset to be had there yeah. for extra parking. I would also assume. We don't know that, but it would be great. Uh, since we're playing with Lindstrom at all, I don't think called split pairs, and yeah. they have the one going there. Is there any, there was talk a number of years ago, a couple of council members brought this back, about that possibly having that with Centennial is being that, or is that just too cumbersome at this point to, to explore at all? Um, I, I wouldn't suggest it for downtown Forest Lake. Um, Highway 8 is a little bit of a different angle to the Lindstrom. Um, and there are some special circumstances that I think made it make it work better in that situation. I think it would really harm downtown. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion. I don't know. Uh, I would suggest it. Dan, do you have a thought about that? Yeah, I would echo Bruce's sentiment on that. I mean, I think it's a tough, because I worked on the slip pairs in this thing that came in, and it's work there, but if you go through Lindstrom now, you still see the existing Highway 8 frontage, and they still have a back door. You know, east, westbound is still very clear that you go through there. Mm -hmm. They've never done the back side of the building to match the front. And, but there overall, where the second or first avenue came in the Highway 8, at 20 and at the beginning of the longboats, they had a little bit different geometry that worked better than for slip pairs here. I think this is a tough read at all for downtown. I also, Centennial's a nice I mean, it doesn't have a lot of walk, uh, a lot of sidewalk space, you know, from a from a the full section doesn't ha isn't doesn't have full sidewalk space. But it is a nice. It's got nice trees. It's got nice green space. It's a nice kind of respite from the travel and traffic on 61. And so I think to kind of maximize that and to up the pedestrian amenities, it gives us a nice kind of break from the congestion that's naturally going to be on 61. My concern with making it kind of to do the Lindstrom approach is you now then make you now have two busy sections of street and you don't have that space that is a little bit quieter or more friendly to pedestrians or bikes or other recreation. Okay, excellent. Uh, the retail loop. Um, so the evolution of re retailing probably suggests that downtown may not support the volume of retail need to be reestablished on multi block loop of storefronts. And I'll, I'll just kind of point my fingers when we read through this. But um, there are currently many gaps in storefronts downtown causing the district to struggle as a cohesive shopping loop. Other, uh, other directors will transform the pedestrian experience, streetscape and otherwise. This one is focused on establishing a continuous pedestrian circuit of storefronts within a subset of the district. So again, going back to the district notion of the quadrants, all the way from second north down to first south and maybe second south west. Um, there was a time in Forest Lakes history when that was the downtown district and there were storefronts essentially lining Lake Street um, on both sides to create the pedestrian loop. And I think I would suggest that trying to reestablish that as the pedestrian downtown loop of Forest Lake is not going to be possible. There's not enough retail that wants to have that kind of downtown experience. Um, to be able to uh, fill all the storefronts that would be needed to do that. So uh, this suggests, and this might be controversial, and that's fine. Um, this suggests that from Broadway up to Second should be your focus for the retail downtown, and that you do everything you can to encourage, control, um, strong arm, whatever uh, way necessary to get retail storefronts that are lining both sides of the lake from Broadway to Second Midwest. And obviously on the west side today, that is not the case. On the east side, there's a stronger um, presence of storefronts, although they're not enjoying the, the district retail.
retail shopping um, loop that you would want out of the downtown. Um, and a lot of that is it's a little bit of a catch-22 or a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't have the storefronts, storefront to storefront to storefront, all the way along to fulfill and fill up that loop, people don't use it as a shopping loop, and that further diminishes the presence of, of storefronts that want to be in that kind of a district. So it's a it's a downward spiral. And in order to turn that around, um, the notion is that you use whatever tools are available to you to establish um, and encourage street front retail, not office retail, um, in this couple block stretch. In, in many ways, I, I guess I see it. that is a place to focus. Absolutely, that's a place that if we're going to use some tools to play it against that that territory. But we look down on the south side and you say, okay, there's the uh, corner lot on the uh, southwest corner that's not developed yet. But there's the open opportunity sitting there. There's the place where you have the uh, Hardwood Creek Trail wayside thing, another open opportunity. Uh, the idea that you could really fulfill those maybe even quicker than these up here on the Northeast uh, is very prominent to me. I think there are that, that opportunity. And when you think that that future development site that's from Vanelli's on back or maybe not Vanelli's on back, but that territory of the U.S. or Lake Erie Bank, I think they sold it uh, to somebody else, but that banking site, those are the things that are going to just pop all of a sudden. And when they pop, then the dynamic is shifted. And so I still think that the loop is the whole territory and that there's great opportunity down here on the southern side to keep that walking corridor going, with Broadway pretty much being the only thing that says no or challenges from a, that. From a character standpoint, I would hope that the development pattern um, creates that energy on the street front so that walking is encouraged. But from a purely retail standpoint, I guess my notion is that you're not going to be able to make it stretch all the way from end to end. And therefore, if you're, if you're needing to concentrate, which I think you are, my suggestion is to concentrate on that stretch north of Broadway and, and not south. Um, and partly it, it has to do with the energy of the park and the, what people perceive, I think, as the core downtown. Already south of Broadway, I think people perceive that they're beginning to leave the downtown core. Whereas I think the perception is that this is the downtown core. So that's part of the thinking that I. Yeah. I just want to make the south side a weak sister to this whole story because I just think that if there is going to be movement, uh, instead of the difficult little movements on the north, east, there's the powerful big movements on the south, west, and south. And I think those things are going to just change that dynamic so that we have now not just the park driving this whole story, but we have more of the streetscape and the retail, because what's going to go on that future development area, both of because I consider the future development area to be over on that southwest corner as well, that uh, you suddenly have, you know, the, the imagery of downtown is really right there on that, in that roundabout. That's the kind of introduction to where you have the clear visions and what can happen. And so it just seems like we shouldn't think one only. Let's not make the other one such a weak sister. Let's make sure it's it sounds terrible to say weak sister. Yes, I mean, it does. But I'll change my so way of talking. <laughs> weak little brother. A weak yeah. sibling. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't defend. I'm completely with you, Mark. I think we're, my, what I suggest is that from a use, and I think it's important that we distinguish between use and development pattern. And to me, the development pattern and I think we agree on this, should be that downtown development pattern all the way through. Whereas um, the uses, as far as using your tools to encourage continuous use of retail storefronts, I would suggest concentrating in that world. And do you, when you say retail, do you mean specifically retail and not restaurants, service? Oh, no. they, they fit in. So, service, probably not. Service probably Office, not. Definitely. But but how about it, how about south of so that would be great south. Yes. That's so that's what it so when, yeah. when you say retail you mean transactional retail north of Broadway. Retailers who are interested in a shopping district 
and their business relies on the success of their new group. And then not a destination And then using so then using that so then using that same language, the future development area to the south, you would say would be housing, office, food and beverage. No, absolutely. All those things. And the choice is open. But I think um, this is more about suggesting that the city find ways to uh, say no to certain uses north and leave open everything that comes your way south, as long as it fits your current zoning code, which is quite nice for the most part. That's a little difficult to do, is it not, for somebody that owns a building? And I'm thinking of the green door space. Well, and I think that just got rented out, and I'm pretty sure it's not retail. Sure. And they weren't going to turn away anybody. Right. That and so, I, and all you can do as a city is do redevelopment, in, in, work out redevelopment uh, uh, agreements with developers who are doing projects, and use the tools at your disposal to encourage it to happen as best you can. And part of that is the placement of amenities, and so you would say parking and other th other amenities that are, you know, necessary for retail to the north, and then focus on other uses to the south. Okay, I'm just trying to understand. You would do your most intensive streetscape mm -hmm. to the north. You would yeah, concentrate, make sure that there's good district parking. That's where you know you get the connection across mm -hmm. the street. So there are other things that would support it. One of, the, one of the points that Mark mentioned and uh, curious to me as well is we still got this open space, um, the southwestern quadrant of the roundabout. You leave that as open space. Did you consider some recreation amenity, the, the um, wayside there? Or it, I think that's, uh, I, I'll say, I think that's a miss on my part. I think that I have not had ideas that have gelled possible either on the north side there's not very much space and then I had this conversation too that it's just hard for me to envision something on that uh, on that quadrant mm -hmm. of the intersection because it, it's just a very tough site from access to right. as most of you know. Um, so it doesn't mean that it should be redeveloped but I don't see it as a critical I guess and maybe I'm wrong on this I don't see it as a critical strategic it's a marquee moment though downtown in that it completes the corner in terms of impression. You can also put five to eight thousand square feet on that and get 40 plus cars on that, that uh, piece of property even with the bypass lane. So the idea that that's, it was before people had a hard time perceiving how do I get to it. I'm going to go around the roundabout then I'm going to come back and I'm going to go all the way down here to get back beyond to Centennial and get to it. And that's only if you're traveling in that one defined direction. You don't see it very clearly. But I've always thought that was a misperception that you can't get there. And that's been the misperception, I think, so far on that piece of property. Mm -hmm. But I think it's dynamic and it's, the one's got the view of the lake, get it up to a second story and get something on that as well and you've got a powerful And, and what, do, what do you think that something could be? Well, it was going to be a bank, <laughs> but no longer a bank. Uh, it was going to be a restaurant at one time as part of the bank, because banks now are turning into smaller square footage things. Uh, but put it all together, there's a home for something there that doesn't have to be immediate retail, just get off because I'm impulsive and I'm going to get off on it. It can be something you're going to. And so, mm -hmm. is the second floor more office oriented? Could be, but, the, but to deny its function and use, I think it would be a miss. There's yeah, a real development site there. For me, I shouldn't even play. I should, you know, basically take the advice that Mark was putting out and at least illustrate it as a redevelopment opportunity um, within the downtown core, and I'll do that. Okay, uh, downtown Greenway. Finally, because of its isolation from the circuit of downtown, Lakeside Memorial Park is only a marginal economic and experiential contributor to the downtown district. Obviously, many people go downtown go to the park. Um, I think what this suggests is that when they do that, they go to the park and maybe not much else. And if you 
there was a bit of an aha early on in the process that, that I had that when you look at Lakeside Memorial Park, it is not connected really much at all to anything else if you're a pedestrian. As a pedestrian, you struggle. It, it's pretty good on the Broadway corridor. But you struggle to find your way back into the downtown core if you're at the park and vice versa. So what this suggests is let's carve out, let's find a way to create, we're calling it a greenway loop, but essentially it is a, a monetized pedestrian corridor that links um, certainly from Lake Street, around the corner, the Lakeside Memorial Park on the north side, and then extends down uh, to Lake using first as the connective tissue of the route. And what that begins to do then is establish this circuit that um, makes the park part of the downtown circuit. And then if you extend that just a little bit farther up north and south, you also connect the part with Street Street. And all of a sudden, downtown then has um, a, a greenway loop. Um, it's about a mile, a little less than a mile circle. Yeah. Um, that becomes part of the walking loop. It becomes part of the socialization of downtown. It connects Lakeside Memorial Park with the shopping district. Um, it does all kinds of things in addition to being a pedestrian connection between park and downtown. But we're pulling pedestrians to two points. One, we'd like to see them walk the streetscape. Two, you want to put them next to the park, part of which is condominiums, I guess, yes, on both ends. Um, and that's privacy stuff. Um, it just seems to me that you got 61, do it really well. You got a park to once you get to it. I can see right in front of the condominiums, that's a little more difficult, but I just picture the, the pedestrian movement when you see the all the parking in front of the condos down on the south end mm -hmm. that are coming into their garages and now gonna, what, face this kind of a trail system or even on the north end. It just seems like it's starting out weak as an idea until it gets to the park. And so I'm, I'm tending to think 61 with points of movement toward it again mm -hmm. uh, is the better way to go instead of the investment being in an actual pedestrian way down here. And I, I think there is um, a desire to be downtown and have a recreational experience, have a social experience apart from a shopping one. And it needs to be connected to the shopping one. But I think um, asking people to always use 61 um, is not, it's not enough for downtown. You have this amenity in the park on the lake. And right now it's an isolated amenity and it's not contributing. And to make this connection around the corner, um, I think could um, be transformational for downtown. I think, you know, it could be if, if it were to be reoriented a bit. Come in from your parking ramp, your skyway, and just presume there's a hope there, and connect there once you're past the condominiums, and then do it down on the other side with the future development area and say, instead of being next to the condos and interrupting their access to their unit, Let's pop <coughs> against the future development area and see if we can't walk along that business streetscape on that side and get down to the Broadway connection. It seems to me the loop is still there. Once you get to the park, the park's got its walkway systems. Well, that's just my thoughts. Other thoughts on Lakeside Memorial Park? One of the things that the plan, as you have lined out, um, solve, one of the issues that it solves that I like is that it does solve issues of trail access to both 61 and also to the lake, and it, in a really healthy way. Like, there's a number of access points um, that today we struggle with. Um, and the attempt was to create the primary pedestrian crossing away from the Broadway intersection because it's such a challenging pedestrian process. Right. Right. How do you study that for us? Yeah, I like it. I mean, it's with the you know one mile loop. I mean, that's a healthy. I'm going to take a couple loops. I'm going to take a nice walk. I think it's a great size. And you're taking advantage of existing roadways. Really, the only other roadways aside from Broadway um, on the north and south side of Broadway. Um, so. 
And I think, you know, especially like on the south side, yeah, you get some condos there, but I mean, that's already a, a road that gets used. Like if traffic's backed up on 61 and I want to get to my office by Lakeside, I'll just sneak past, you know, the old alleys. Um, yeah, I think that you could easily integrate that and create, you know, I mean, obviously accommodate people's residences, but no, I think it's I think there's an opportunity to create a, a, a nice pedestrian corridor adjacent to the driveway access as part of a redevelopment strategy. Mm -hmm. So that was part of it. Okay, I'm going to kind of burn through these because we're going to run out of time. <coughs> um, uh, lake recreation. The lake is an underutilized recreational asset that holds potential for greater programming through all seasons to draw people into downtown from the lake and attract people to downtown to enjoy the very good experiences. So the directive of that is to expand recreational programming in all seasons and take some and the lake one downtown program. So the strategies are to increase the number and enhance the quality of, of transient boat slopes. So today you've got a, a it's called a marginal dock, but you have a, a straight line dock that functions as your transient. And it probably accommodates, from what I understand, in talking to folks, uh, four, five, six, maybe four boats. And the notion is to essentially create finger docks attached to that marginal dock. So you formalize and kind of create safe um, parking spots for boats to pull in just like the marina uh, to the north, or most marinas. And, um, with that, the notion is to kind of create that safe transient slip experience and uh, to increase the number maybe to a dozen or so so that people have some reasonable expectation that if they go downtown towards Lake from the lake, you know, they're probably going to find a parking spot fairly soon or there's one there for them. The next one is to establish a shore launch tie-up beach area for a new kayak. So uh, there's a little bit of a quiet water um, behind the, the your dock uh, facility that seems to accommodate the possibility for a beach area for a new kayak launch. And most kayakers and canoers do better with beach landing than a dock landing. Um, some have different opinions about that. But so it seems like a, a beach spot is going to accommodate folks maybe in a better way. You, you would need to create a little uh, kind of locks or locking stanchions so people can lock their boats while they're there in downtown um, and know that they're secure. Next one, introduce winter programming such as room ball, pond hockey, free skate, speed skate you know, potentially. Um, winter, I think, is a huge opportunity for the lake. We know we have ice dam issues in this spot, um, so there's some technical issues that would need to be overcome, um, but I think winter could be really great. And then the next one, um, improve the sight lines and character at the snowmobile lake access on 2nd South. It's really a matter of opening up the landscape just a little bit so people feel more comfortable and more knowing about how they reach the lake by snowmobile. And then finally, enhance shoreline aesthetics and improve resistance to ice action through bioengineering strategies. So right now, um, the riprap that's along the lake is relatively small, and um, there could be strategies that make the riprap part of a broader strategy of bioengineering that introduce native plants, um, larger stone, use the larger stone to resist the ice action. Um, some things that might be able to be done in order to improve both the aesthetics and When I read that establishing a shore launch tie up feature, I thought that was like, really, why haven't we done that? <laughs> I mean, they see people there all the time, right? And it's like, and I would guess they're frustrated that they can't tie up to the shore today because it's all, unless they go to the beach, it's the only sand pretty much. But you don't want to. Okay, the trail um, invitation. So there's first invitation to cyclists on Harbor Creek Trail to visit downtown. As a result, the district captures few trail users, and the trail is only a marginal economic or experiential contributor to the district. So 
So the directive is to establish an inviting gateway experience into downtown from the Hardwood Creek Trail. Uh, and the strategy is to create a trail wayside um, park, essentially it's a park space, on the First Avenue Southwest alignment between Lake Street and Centennial. And the program for that space could be bike lockers and service station, bike service station, picnic facilities, a shelter, playground, games, drinking fountain, lawn and shade, wayfinding and information kiosk. And for the most part, um, strategically, obviously this consumes space. This consumes downtown space. Um, but I think the, the upshot of it is that people see it from Lake Street. They, if it is designed correctly, they begin to associate it with the trail. Uh, the trail users begin to associate it with downtown. And those who are on the trail, um, this would be an easy, iconic um, place to hop off the trail. And if it's connected with then the Rubber Greenway, um, there are opportunities, obviously, that they get downtown. Mark doesn't like this. I think you're valuing that now secondary park too much, uh, given it's kind of following just pedestrians and bikers and maybe snowmobilers are set aside from that. But I think you're valuing that way too much and I don't see it ever being overriding the commercial incentives that would be on that piece of property and the continuation of the downtown uh, retail hospitality environment. Um, I just, I just think we're, we're valuing it way too high for functions that are minimally used. That uh, I got more I could say about it, but I'll stop right there. Um, and it concedes too much. Even, even with the volume we hear about of trail usage and people wanting destination bike, I mean destination bikes and having, um, you know, that's a that is it, it is a it is a customer, and I want to offer them their their route. I'm not trying to take the route away, but the concession of all that territory, and don't forget the house that's a business just to the south of that, that should be thought of as the same part of parcel, because that's how a developer would look at it. Uh, it's just giving up too much. Let's give them a lane through, uh, make it as pretty as you can, but let's not devote it to such a secondary function when people are, what, going to the park. The park is where they're headed. So you That's, think the footprint's too big? Oh, by far, yes. And it concedes too much of the great value, which could have been retail and otherwise. So is that space and the house that's a business, is that owned by the same person? No, I think they're two owners. That's just two owners. That's that, actually easy to work with. That, that's easier to work And one's vacant and one's been held for a long time. Uh, at any rate, once you start going south from Broadway, and if you can get some development on that first intersection and you got the Kodiak coffee and the other things happening along the way that are personality buildings, if not retail directly, then you got this great spot just behind that strip center that becomes something. Uh, but don't take it away so it gets to be a, a city burden because it's got used during what part of the year and then no part of the year after that. Um, I just don't value that very high. Uh, I go back to the, the lakeside park area too and I applaud the idea of the boathouse, not the boathouse, <laughs> the uh, bathhouse not being the objects that are there. In fact, if I had my ways, it would come down to where the boat launch is, or excuse me, where the boats enter the lake down there in that little, uh, exaggerate that spot and call that our bathroom spot. Uh, and I'm still trying to preserve Benton's Memorial and everything else that will be there. Let, let's come back to this one. I think another way we can look at it as part of an overall redevelopment strategy in this area. Um, what I think what I view as kind of most important to this strategy piece or this directive is that there visually is a very clear connection between the trail and downtown. And this notion of greenway connection is, again, visually really apparent. What would be a bummer is if a developer um, cut off both visual and physical access in this spot because it is the one opportunity you have to make the direct. And if it doesn't happen here, I question where, where it's going to. So. But I think comments about maybe too much space, I, I think I, we should redraw this in 
the context of the redevelopment strategy that tightens up the Greenway corridor and potentially puts um, commercial use that would be supportive of the bike trail Social sidewalk network. So a few sidewalks link the surrounding neighborhood to the downtown district. Sidewalks that do exist lack a door-to-door -door linkage, um, as well as the social design or pedestrian comfort. As a result, few neighbors choose to walk downtown from their homes even if they live within a community block. So the directive is to establish a door-to-door -door sidewalk network designed as social sidewalks through the surrounding neighborhood with direct connections the strategies would be to expand the sidewalks uh, using the departed Oregon and social sidewalk philosophies and to concentrate sidewalk investments within the 10 minute walk. Um, and sidewalks are, I've talked about this before, but I, I find it fascinating because there's so much psychology around how people will or will not use them. And if they have to cross the street, like many communities will put a sidewalk on one side of the street and not the other. Or in order to minimize uh, shoveling or save space, the four, four foot or three and a half foot sidewalk there. So you kind of have to be all in if you really want sidewalks to work with a dimension that's at least five, ideally away from or a boulevard, three boulevard space between the curb and the sidewalk and sidewalks on both sides of the streets that reach kind of the whole network capacity. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do. Putting sidewalks into existing neighborhoods is really hard. Um, you should sit the lake. This one is probably kind of crystal clear. Visitors barely gain a glimpse of Lake One from the downtown street network. Seeing the lake as they travel through offers visitors a subtle yet powerful connection to Forest Lake's core identity. So open the view shed to Lake One from the Broadway Avenue Lake Street intersection. Strategies are to consider alternative design solutions such as art and lighting for Broadway Avenue roundabout that allows visitors, visitors to see beyond it to Lake One. The second one is to locate new beach house in a place that does not obscure the view to Lake One. Yes. In the next slide, I'll show you one idea for that. And then analyze view shed impacts and future landscaping decisions. It's the one spot where you have a chance to see the lake, and it just means that you should uh, close the opportunities to see that lake. I like that idea. Lots of heads nodding. Um, and then this was the idea, and this, uh, it sounds like this actually may have been part of original vision for the development of this building, but the idea of incorporating uh, the use of the beach house within the building itself, creating patio space on the edge of the building. Maybe there's a concession that operates out of that corner as well, um, and then direct connection to the beach, which I think does a whole bunch of things. One, it gets rid of the building that probably needs to be um, reconstructed, um, and it opens up the view from this corridor as well, so it's part of that. The imposition on the plaza building is a dramatic <laughs> proposition. Yeah, they, have to, they have to decide how to see it. So that part would trouble me, but I think you have options for the bathhouse, and I think the bathhouse can move down to the northern end of the park as a possibility. Um, it just, I don't yeah, see the integration of the plaza and the bathhouse from going from a fairly high value retail service space to a low value, you know, city supported proposition, which is a closed thing with all that glass and all the ability to look at the lake. But it just doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Yeah, it, it may not. And I, I recognize that, but um, it's worth the question. Um, I mean? Navigating downtown can be confusing for those who don't know. Establish, uh, the directive is to establish district wayfinding to uh, direct visitors to popular destinations and districts. Strategies are to conduct the downtown branding process and then implement a district wide wayfinding signage strategy that incorporates that branding, whatever you have to sign on. So the number of years ago, the EA went through that, and we do have some wayfinding signs, and it was a challenge because of MnDOT, it's where they could be, what, and their location, and they were just generic looking. I mean, they're okay, but they're just generic, not unique as this picture here. So I just, there goes the bigger question.
question about the turn back and allowing more, you know, the county giving us more say of what we can do. I mean, at this point, we have to get okay to put certain pots, containers for planter nuts, but our sidewalks still so it's this is a challenge until it's turned back. That's where the city decides to go. It sounds like an exploration of the turn back. You mean well, at the county level, right? At the county level. Yeah. Now, so you, that, you don't want it. Well, uh, <laughs> turn back. We have a we have a long history of turn backs not working to our favor. Mm. These, and then the last one. But there was just like a handful of these spots out along Centennial, really, that you were talking about putting those. Yeah. Yeah, there are key spots, um, and you know maybe it's fortunate that they're apart from Lake Street. But still, you have to get off. You have to get folks directly to those spots from the street for the most part. Um, so there, has got to be some interaction with Linda. Um, but the key areas are to get people on the sentinel from either end or from Broadway. Um, so and then finally, activation. Regular happenings in the categories of recreation and entertainment through all seasons will provide ongoing reasons for downtown visits. And the directive is, in addition to larger, more prominent events, expand routine and regular downtown happenings. So to collaborate with, of course, the Chamber and maybe other organizations to develop everyday routine downtown district events and happenings like music, art, and music kind of uh, lower case now. Not big music events, um, you know, a little band that's playing on the street corner or something, that kind of thing. Art, sales, crafts, tours, recreation, um, um, kind of a, a, a weekly calendar, and then the weekly calendar changes by season, but they have a calendar with all those little things happening that will occur if we get to come down to the Okay, so what I heard is that um, more of a focus and strategy for what happens in the quadrant, and probably both quadrants to some extent, Here at Broadway, focus on those two things. To expand the notion of district parking into this area, as well as um, in the southeast quadrant. Um, those were two things. Let's see. Let's see. Shrinking the um, trail wayside footprint oh, yeah. a bit. Yeah.
off the space downtown is a negative for whatever reason. Maybe we want more retail and restaurants, but you, know, you look at downtown Anoka, government centers downtown Anoka, and that town really thrives because of all the employees working there. They put lunch, happy hour at a, at a place like here, Bob. I think we need to embrace office space just as much as retail. And maybe realize that that ultimately maybe with, with brick and mortar going away that you know there are there really only are a few retail stores that really survive in say downtown Stillwater or the local lake, the real strong ones. But but most of that is restaurant and real seasonal business. I think if we try to embrace the office thing, that's what really what the trend has been historically and take advantage of the employees that are there every day and come and use the goods and services through downtown. I think long term that, that is a good thing. It shouldn't be some, a negative perception. It should be embraced. Could that be accomplished by multi-level and have commercial on the second and third levels and retail on the street level? Yeah, when, when, when uh, EDA was involved with the uh, Lighthouse Loss Project, you know, the developer really wanted to stay away from retail at all. As a matter of fact, it was the um, the former mayor who really pushed that and wanted at least one or two spaces, and that's why they ended up doing putting Snap in there. Because um, that just wouldn't, that, they, they do the research, it's just that's not where the numbers go to make money. These guys need to, if they're going to do it, invest in foresight, they got to do it, get some most money. So you almost have to let them lead the conversation, I think, and see where that goes and try to push back a little bit to your point, Bruce, as far as, as trying to direct that. but. It's got to go with the numbers make sense with it. I think office space having people working downtown is, is, is key. Just think what, what's happening with the out, out of people working downtown the last year and a half. The town is really struggling. So I, I think, yeah, retail is key, but office space should be looked at it just as strong. Yeah. I had thought of your job here would be to speculate on five years out, 10 years out, 20 years out. And so the balance of the northern property that you don't have really contained here when you're doing the schematic form uh, that travels north yet, that we don't have any thoughts about. Are you moving forward with thoughts on that in terms of uh, speculation on long term? So I think downtown plans are part speculation of what might happen from a redevelopment standpoint. But frankly, they are equally or just as much, even more. So. What you are, what kinds of investments the community is making in the public realm and in connectivity in order to support the kind of redevelopment that you want to occur. Um, the reason I haven't focused on those areas to the north is that um, it just doesn't feel, again, from a redevelopment standpoint, it doesn't feel like it is critical whatever happens in those spaces is critical to the success of downtown. Um, and what is critical to the success of downtown is the investment you are making as a community in connections and public realm, essentially within the loop that shows up um, most prominently in this space. That's why. Um, and what happens from a redevelopment standpoint um, farther north or farther so south you want to have the best character. You want it to contribute to um, the identity of the community without question. But from a downtown district um, success standpoint, they don't feel like they're at the center of the downtown. It seems like a number of those sites can transition toward more uh, dense housing, for example all of which would support the downtown uh, within a good walking through. I just, I hope over time here as you move toward taking this out, just the simple schematics of movement and put it into the schematics of or actual or design development, that there's at least attention paid to what's gonna, could happen up there. So that could guide us in thinking that there is the property where Roop's Tire is and the Diagonal Road is and all of that stuff sitting up there that is an extension of the housing that's already there. And there's stuff that's going to transition on the other side as well that's got, obviously will transition at some point in time. Uh, it's, it's old stuff that's going to go away at, at some point. Um, I just think we need to see some sort of speculation on what that could be. I don't see you going across Centennial and going west to any great degree, even though there's, there's always been a desire to uh, somehow get Broadway to be active all the way down to the roundabout. 
but the pedestrian bridge, you know, sort of cuts that line. And then you got senior housing, but you're going to have the whole property developed. I think those are all turned into something else, but there was this whole idea of movement through there yet as an extension. Downtown just didn't quit right there at the pedestrian bridge. budget ahead of everything and so from a budget standpoint I think we've got some challenges there but if you know certainly um, the benefits that we would get from a turn back and what we're looking for in that I think need to be part of the plan um, and then ultimately we're going to have to you know as a group make recommendations around prioritization of projects and I think that's the lens when budget comes in and prioritization comes in and so I don't mean to don't mean to kind of throw a bucket of cold water and really good ideas at this point. So I think right now we need, like, what is it that we're not getting from those relationships and what we what we want in a turn back and kind of consider that as part of the plan. So I just wanted to circle back on that. And so who is going to put price tags on some of this? Stuff? Well, that's a great question, Ben, for next I step. Do? So oh, awesome. Yeah, let's talk about what okay. so next steps for this and then ultimately. Yeah, next steps for this are to bring these in uh, modified form to the community um, in both online, uh, digital, and in-person community workshop. Uh, gain feedback, critique, ideas about what they like and don't, uh, and so on, and then bring those back to this committee uh, for review and analysis of what you quote for. And then to begin to um, take the line items of the strategies and and to prioritize them based on all the feedback. And uh, at that point then, we will begin to put budget numbers to them and work out a, a preliminary, really preliminary capital sources and uses strategy um, for them as well. Did I hear you say we were, you were looking for maybe a community meeting yet before the end of the year? Is that? If we could do it. We should. We should talk about. Yeah. So I would just suggest, suggest in the holidays, pretty busy, so we want the most. I would suggest uh, pushing it, but. It's, well, I so I was going to suggest maybe some preliminary online information out there, collect some preliminary feedback, and then do kind of a full in person session after the first of the year. Um, if cause I, I share Blake's concern of getting attention at this time of the year. So. Okay. We'll figure out so we'll get something on the calendar early January for a community workshop. Are there points of feedback we should get in yet this evening? All right, so 2 o'clock in the morning, someone has their next good idea. Should they be emailing Dan, <laughs> no, getting feedback to Dan? Dan. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 2 a.m. Perfect. Yeah. All right. So I love this map. Okay. I love the map. Yeah, this visual is really, this visual is really good. If I want to set up a discussion with you, you and I, again, is that where I'm headed? Dan, first, if I can get something set up. Yeah, you know, we'll get it. I'll coordinate schedule. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I so move. Motion and second. All those in favor signal by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? And we're adjourned. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.